I'm outside at 2 a.m. in my pajamas on the back of my house, standing on my porch, which is collapsing and falling off my house. And I have a rat that's alive in a cage and it's thrashing in there trying to eat the wire. And I can't sleep when I hear a, a rat thrashing outside my window. So I'm trying to go down my mountain with the cage because that's the only way to get off the back porch. And it's wet and rainy and slippery and I'm falling and my phone fell out of my pocket and I'm sliding down the hill with a rat in the middle of the mountains. and Nobody knows this is going on on the planet. And as I stood out there in my pajamas in the middle of my yard, set the rat down on the ground and started making my way back to the house. I was like, this isn't the high status life that um, I'm wanting. Hey, welcome back to the Pretty Men Brothers podcast. Five brothers on the pursuit of success, talking about our success, talking about our failures. Today's going to be a little bit different. We don't really have a direct path. Um, just kind of a boys podcast, talking about what we've been doing the last few weeks. Garrett's got a rat problem. I had some problems with my Airbnb. People are stupid. You need to focus and design your product and what you sell for the stupid person because that's the majority of them. So you don't want to sell to a select few people which are smart. The majority of them are stupid. So that should be your focus, making it as easy as possible. We have had all sorts of problems with our remote lock. It's not just as simple as sending a code. You send the code and they will message you anyways. Where is the code? It's like they did not find the code that you sent. And, and so you send it again and they already, it, for whatever reason, they're going to lose the code. So it's almost a guarantee you send the code twice. Secondarily, if you have any other things on the property that have a combo, they're going to try that code on those other things. So in our case, it's like a lockbox on the next to the door on the side of like in on the siding. It's not even really, it's, it's not a electronic device. It's where we store our spare key. And I was observing through the camera, every single guest would try the code on that lockbox. Like, this is so funny. Do they think that that's a remote lock? We literally said remote lock and yet they're trying it there. And then I changed the messaging to say, not the lockbox next to the door, but the door itself. And all of a sudden, everyone goes right to the door. So just looking at what people are naturally doing and tuning your instructions can just save you a headache. Honestly, there's a, a key principle that will put money into your account. And that principle is the ability to take something complicated and make it very simple. A lot of stuff rolls out and it, people don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. They get confused. A confused mind never buys. A confused mind, it's like, it's just too much. It's too overwhelming. And when you look at like the archetypes we spoke about earlier this spring, the, the ancient magician, his role in a kingdom was to contemplate the stars, uh, look into prophetic uh, versions of the future, and to really understand the intricacies of how governments work and people interacting and what could be the best path forward. But he needed to make it deliverable to the king in a way that was actionable. And sometimes the king himself would actually make it even more clear as just a straightforward declaration as once it was explained to him what was really going on because he was missing it. He could then give a straight decree that would accomplish what needed to be done. But honestly, a lot of people didn't know the ingredients that went into the loaf. You could say the king handed them the loaf and the people enjoyed it, but they had no idea all the back parts that were necessary for that final execution. And if we think we're going to add value to something, it needs to be, it'll be the most profitable when it's something that was complicated, but now it's easy and simple and that any man can do it, copy it, have it, use it. So maybe like in the artistic world, something that's really intricate might collect a few niche people that appreciate the complexities of something, but the general population is going to find the most value when you take something complicated and you make it simple. And you can even see that in sales copy. In sales copy, it's always written at a like fourth or fifth grade reading level. And that's because it's easily digestible. And even an intelligent person doesn't necessarily want to read something that's complicated. It takes effort. But uh, with emails and headlines, simple, precise, and targeted for the everyday reader is where you'll find like the most success, the most clicks. I've seen this with my YouTube titles, actually. It's crazy because at first we think, oh, I'm going to think of a really good YouTube title. It's going to be so colorful and different and really spin the mind and make people want to see what's behind it. And so you'll think, I'll think of something like, for example, I have a video I'm releasing this weekend about my confidence course that I'm running with a colleague. And at first I was thinking of like, you know, how to turn insecurity into intimacy 
or addressing the root causes of personality um, dysfunction. And then I realized all it needs to say is how to be confident. <laughs> like, seriously, just say it, man. Just spit it out and say it. Don't beat around the bush. It's like you're insinuating instead of just saying it. And if you insinuate, people are going to take it a thousand different ways and they're not even going to land on what you're trying to communicate. This last week, I had an example at work on making a complicated, simple. And it's interesting thing when you run a meeting and you have peers that also understand the problem and you make the meeting unproductive. You both are, everyone's capable of understanding what we're doing here. Yet we came out of the meeting, no better place than we started. And I came to see based on the questions asked that the screen that was shared was a wall of information that was too complicated and everyone took their thought of what they thought that information meant and ran with a million ideas and butted heads and went nowhere. So the next iteration of this meeting, which I told this individual that wrote the doc and was running the meeting to do is, we need to make it very simple. What are we even trying to solve here? What's the problem? Can we agree on that with a little picture? Step two, each component of what we're trying to solve, what it's going to do, just in the most like basic picture, and then have an optional thing they can click if they want more details. You have to like funnel people in a direct direction to make something productive. It would be like saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to build like this motorcycle jet has on this screen. I'm going to tell you how to mill the crank and it's the, the right bit and all the comp complicated intricacies around that when we don't even know why we need a crank yet. So we have to start and, and direct the people to the problems so they understand the necessity of the solution. I remember when I was invoicing by hand a lot back in the day, how many people were misinterpreting my descriptions of the items as I wrote them down because I wasn't being specific and clear. And Here's a way you can catch yourself. If you are a person who tends towards the vague, if somebody asks you a fairly direct question, like you're invited over for a barbecue this Saturday, can you make it? And your reply is, well, I have a veterinary clinic appointment with my dog in the afternoon. I need to call my mom. Something needs to be pulled out of the garage for a sale tomorrow. So, uh, and I, I'm not sure if I have dinner plans. Okay. You've just put the decision-making process into the hands of the other person. You gave them all the ingredients, hoping they would go, wow, you're really busy, so you're probably not going to make it, are you? Which is also sort of vague and insinuative. Instead of literally just, you know what you got going on, just tell them yes or no. But we're offloading responsibility when we make other people have to call the choice for us. It's not our job to de deliver all the ingredients so other people can make our choices. We can actually make our own choices since we actually already see the ingredients. But it takes a certain amount of, amount of self-confidence to look at the menu you're working with and chart a course based on that and not worry about if people like it or not or if it's the right choice. But you're the one who made the call because you're the one that knows the details. And when other people work with a man like that, they feel a release of pressure because he knows what he wants. He knows how to get there. And he's doing it on his own without other people having to hold his hand. On my first rental property, I wasn't, it, it was a property where there was no pets allowed. And when the property was leased, the tenants asked if there was a potential in the future that I would allow a pet on the property. And at the time, I didn't have the confidence to just break their hearts and say, no, I'm not going to allow a pet on this property. So I said, yeah, I'll consider it. Well, it, three months rolls around and they ask the answer. I, I know the answer is still no, but I break their hearts again and again. And that in my trying to feel like, Oh, I want to be nice. I don't want to be bold. It, it actually is worse off towards them and meaner, meaner towards the customer rather than just a direct no moving on. And it's not as crazy as you would think as it feels, you know, to be on the other end of a no. If somebody asked, if you were in their shoes and you asked if they could have pets and you said no, they'd be like, oh, no pets here. But when you're the person telling them no, you feel a tremendous responsibility, a big weight on your shoulders for some reason. The person saying no is the person that has power. The person saying yes, although they may have chosen that choice, is the one that, that technically doesn't, isn't using their power. And we'll just take it right to the point of having lots of girls. You. The, the guy that's not but can is in a power position. The guy that can't is obviously not in a power position, but the guy that can and does is not controlling his no. 
isn't it interesting though when like you call somebody and you're like what time do you guys close if he's like well you know we got a bunch of boxes to load and i think so and so is coming in late and it's like okay well he didn't tell you what time it's very frustrating but if he'd simply said oh we close at four and you were like no not four i need to be there before you close and i don't get off work till five it's like what it does is it creates a direction that you can go from now it's like until somebody drew a line in the sand nobody knew what was in and what was out and what was going to work and wasn't going to work it's like people don't have certainty until somebody gets certainty and it might as well be you that's a quote that my mentor uses all the time that i like to remind myself He's like, if not me, then who? There's no course on this topic on the internet yet. Well, might as well be me then. Nobody's ever tried this certain thing or, or offered this certain value point in, in their services. Well, why not me? Like everybody's waiting for somebody else to go. I like that Colton correlated that with power because that's interesting that I am uncomfortable with power. It's easier to be in the servant role than to be the man that actually has power. It's a very uncomfortable feeling if you aren't used to that. When you see an abnormal response to something, so let's just say that people are saying yes to you and you do something weird like disappear off the earth. Like that's kind of an abnormal response. Maybe they're saying yes to you and you need to figure out why you're just falling off the face of the earth. But with the power position, like you were just saying, you be, might be afraid to say no because of power. You're like, oh my God, I don't know what to do with this. So you just kind of like default to the other side. I'll just accommodate and say, yes, even though I've been bitter because I didn't really want to like, yeah, I'm going on this camping trip and I wish I was doing something else. It's something to observe is how you feel when you say that answer, whatever it is, yes or no, because you might be responding from that situation out of actually a different situation. I'll tell you why power can feel scary. It comes with a buttload of responsibility. So for example, look at a hundred husband and wife situation. Let's say the in-laws call and they're like, can you guys come over for dinner tonight? And let's say the husband turns to the wife and says, can we go to their house for dinner tonight? And she says, no. Then the husband is the messenger and says, no, we can't. But he didn't make the decision. She did. Well, now if the in-laws are upset, they're not upset at him. He's just the message bearer. So it offloads all the responsibility of consequences to the person that said no. And I see and I've done that myself in relationships before. And I see men do it all the time because it's the path of ease. Let her take the, take the fall. Let her call a shot. You know, we're completely innocent. <laughs> what have we done? So to face the power is to own the responsibility too. Corporations have this dialed. It's always ambiguous who makes the decision. Plausible deniability. You don't, there's, who, whose head's on the line? So in this last case, my company, there was no pay changes this year. No pay changes for anyone. But then us as the managers, we're the ones that have to deliver this. Our hands are tied. We we would have happily given, could we? But then it's just all abstract. Who do we actually go to for this problem? Well, nobody. We don't know. So we're just the messengers. But it's an effective way when you have people that are working for you, or you you can use this to your advantage. If you let people know, most people are afraid of being confident. But if you give them the ability to do something without having their head on the line, they may actually just execute whatever you tell them to do. Remember when Michael Scott was forced to fire somebody? Actually, that whole show, Michael Scott was a prime example of a man that was scared to use his power because he was scared people wouldn't like him. It's easier to say, oh, does, does the garbage can go to the left or the right of the toilet? And you'd be like, oh, it goes to the left. Those decisions are easy to pop off. But if it's like, should we get a blue, a gray, or a brown you know, garbage can? It's like, oh boy, now the power is on. And so you might, oh, I don't care. You know, it's why is it that it's so hard to make that decision versus where it goes? In uh, sales, I always I always ask people, uh, I don't ask them, what's, what color do you want? I always say, do you like lighter or darker colors? Because then if they say darker colors, I have an array of, I, I make the decision for them at that point. They can't say, oh, we don't like blue, we like red, you know? I just make it very vague, and that way they have, they aren't put in that position where they have to choose. I can choose for them. Because for me, as a guy that's not going to be driving the car the rest of my life, I have no problem choosing them a color. That is that is funny. Jackson, you even just called me this last week on the price of a rental property. <laughs> I don't care. Heck, charge it low, rent it fast, raise it high. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and that's the nice thing about having people around you with knowledge is you can bounce ideas off each other because 
really there is no right or wrong decision but you can kind of get a majority rules decision on some things. And that's why it's important to surround yourself with individuals that you not only trust, but you believe also have knowledge in topics that you're trying to make decisions on. So what I was thinking when you said that actually is how it actually clarified for me and what Jed was saying, you don't sometimes know what you want until somebody says something and then you feel a resistance to it. You're like, Oh, I don't like that price or I don't like that color. It helps direct you. Yeah, a lot of times you don't know where you stand unless there's something to kick against. Otherwise, you're just freewheeling. And one thing I've noticed about men I really look up to that are highly successful is when I ask them a very direct question, like, how do I X, Y, Z? They never give me the step-by-step response. They always direct me back to like, well, what would make sense for you? What would be the right result that you're looking for? Where do you want to end up? Because... If we're following somebody else's advice to the T, we're walking their path, not our path. And like, just because the hamburger between their ears decided something should be a certain way doesn't invalidate that the hamburger between our ears can also have opinions and things to go off of. And it's crazy how a lot of times when you start acting on the confidence of, of a clear decision, stuff just falls in alignment around it. And it's the new truth because people really don't want to have to make up their minds. It's, it's been shown that um, offer too many options and people don't buy. They want it. They want some options so they don't feel like they're being have it shoved down their throat, but they want it very basic. So like when you're building a website, even if you have a thousand products on that page, I mean, it's just overwhelming that they move on. If you have it clean and just a couple of easy points to go from and it's kind of sorted for you, you'll get a higher return on engagement and people actually going for it. They can relax. Somebody else made up their mind. They don't have to think about it. Another thing you can do is funnel people to one decision so you can. Um, have a product and you're like, okay, I know the product's worth this much money. This is what I'm going to sell it for. This package is this. Um, but what you can do is offer us another package that's super expensive and another package that's super cheap that has like really lame products. So you're going to funnel them to the product you want them to buy anyway, because they're obviously going to make that choice, but they have the, it's forcing them to make that choice. And then if you get lucky, someone might go for the really expensive package and worst comes to worst, they buy the really cheap package, but you're kind of funneling them towards the one that is actually priced correctly. Which I mentioned on a few podcasts ago, something I'm going to introduce to my business is the holy grail package. The one that's so expensive, so crazy, so packed with value. I couldn't see anybody pulling the trigger on it ever. It's too massive. Now it would be worth my time if they pulled the trigger on it because of the cost, but it's, it can be smart to have that one thing that's so premium and so gold that everybody goes for the silver package. It, it gives it more desirability. If you're, if what you're trying to sell is your top and best, and there's nothing beyond that, you're actually going to limit the amount of people that are going to go for it because it seems like it might be too much or too overwhelming or too expensive. But in comparison to something that's even bigger, then it doesn't seem like that. It's all psychological. You know, here we are rambling about details that we've learned in business and things that we've dealt with in our companies and trying to be profitable and increase clarity and, and, and move forward in being self-reliant and creating income. But at the same time, we are just a couple of dudes from the woods that ran around on bicycles and dirt bikes trying to live like Tarzan. And that here we are in the world trying to make money, buy properties, run businesses and create cash flow. So just to keep it relatable, that are you the kind of man that is like us? Well, you're not going to know that if we don't talk about us. So yes, Colton mentioned earlier, last week, my week was filled with yanking an engine out of my 08 Tundra because it blew a head gasket and putting a new engine in that truck. That was a very intense two weeks of many wires, bolts, and holes. Colt was helping me break loose flywheel bolts and <laughs> pull engine mounts out, get the truck engine in. Everything's good. I returned to one of my uh, vacation homes discover that rats had taken over the shed and got into the back deck. And I've never had to deal with rats in my life. And I'm a man who hates rodents. Mice are like the bane of my existence. And rats are like giant versions of those little guys. And so I really had to do something that every man has had to do. This is, this is masculinity in a nutshell right here. If nobody else is doing something, you know you just have to do it. You have to suck it up and just do it. And so while I'm laying in bed, Hearing a rat get caught in a live trap outside, just thrashing in the wire. I'm like, I can't sleep with this ruckus. Nobody's going to walk in my house and deal with the rat for me. Nobody's going to walk out in the dark, pick it up and carry it off and deal with it. 
I did not want to. Every fiber in my body was like, no, I don't want to do this. This is disgusting. I wanted to get on a chair like a little girl and just scream and never touch the floor again because maybe the rat, mouse or rat could touch that. Like I'm just so repulsed by him. We get it from our grandpa. He was the same way. But masculinity is able to take emotion and set it aside and lean into logic and take a step forward. That's exactly what I did. As I walked out my back door, climbed my hill in my pajamas in the dead of night, carrying a nasty rat in a cage, sliding down my slope, which is quite steep, and leaving it in the yard way on the other side of my place so I wouldn't have to hear it banging around all night so I could deal with it in the morning, I was operating on pure logic. I had a mantra I was telling myself with every step I took as my phone fell out and slid down the hill and I was hating every moment of this, I was like, it's a squirrel. I'm carrying a squirrel. Rats are squirrels. I can handle squirrels. I just kept telling myself that mantra to calm my nervous system that just wanted to throw it and scream. So that is a gift that every man has. We've all been in that point where the family's in tears, the animal is sick, something tragic has happened. There's been an accident. It's not the time to scream and run around like a chicken with your head cut off. You have to take the emotion aside, lean into your logic, and just take the next step forward. That's what men have to do. Now, it's unhealthy to not then go back and reprocess what did that feel like? Oh man, it was just like this and this and this and get it out. Some people journal it out. Some people talk it out like I am right now. If you repress it, it's a ticking time bomb. So the gift of masculinity being the logic is there, the emotion can be set aside, can be tremendous in the world of business and success too, because sometimes our emotions are literally in the way. They are preventing us from taking action. They're preventing us from owning the power. But our logic knows what needs to be done. And if nobody else is going to do it, why not me? Is, is the mantra my mentor reminds me of to, to step forward anyway. That's good. Good message. Well, Colton, talk about why your legs burnt to make it relatable, the kind of man you are. <laughs> <laughs> So Jackson and I went dirt biking this last week behind Garrett's vacation house in the wildernesses of Idaho. And something I came to realize is on the simple to complicated conversation or complicated to simple is sometimes we make the simple complicated. And this runs in our family too, is we make a project way bigger than it ever has to be and therefore it can't get done. So when the guy goes and puts a Jeep on a trailer, services the Jeep, packs the Jeep full of camping gear, food for three days, it's so complicated. It may not ha ever happen maybe once a year. Dirt biking, on the other hand, is very simple. Throw that thing in the truck, go dirt bike, come back, eat dinner, go to bed. So recircling back to that realization how simple dirt biking is and how much fun it is, we had an absolute blast. And even though I burned my leg, I would burn my leg again. <laughs> simple. It's much better than the complicated. <laughs> I've never dirt biked when it's just dumping rain, but there's not a lick of chill in the air. We were soaked to the bone within the first couple of minutes. Um, the leaves were just whipping against our legs and filled our boots full of water. But we, we pounded out probably like 40 miles nonstop um, within about an hour. Oh, it's all single track. Yeah, I saw it dumping rain out there and I closed my door and stayed dry. <laughs> and it was intimidating because we often would, we, we, we'd usually have an excuse like, well, it's not perfect. You know, we almost could go back. It's just water and it wasn't even cold. And once we were wet, how much worse can it get? <laughs> I will say though, with the goggles fogged up with water on it until I, we, figure out a way to clean them or take them off it was like driving and kind of like a dream like you were looking through this windshield and you kind of were just like floating <laughs> <laughs> i trained for that moment for years with my cracked phone screen i knew how to look through it <laughs> into the scenery jed how'd that heater core go yeah speaking of uh doing hard things that uh regardless of how you feel i was just talking to jackson about this and so I recently did a heater core in my car um, and I made it into a much bigger deal than it really needed to be just because I, uh, you learn more about yourself as you get older and that helps you overcome some things. But uh, one of the hardest projects I had done, it wasn't necessarily like difficult. It was just time consuming and a lot of bolts you couldn't reach. 
um, at one point I was trying to feed a vacuum hose into the very back of my dash because I'd forgotten to put it in after I had reassembled everything. And I probably spent an hour with my fingers like this, uh, using the back of my fingers so that our hands are wrapped around my dash, trying to thread in this uh, vacuum hose. It was very tight. And I just kept trying over and over and over again because I did not want to rip that dash back apart, put that vacuum hose on. But I ended up having to take it apart again because I found a wire after I put it, reassembled everything. And then it turns out that wire was uh, a non, it wasn't meant for anything. It was meant for a disc changer, which my car didn't even have. So I did the project twice, which was fun. But after I got done with that, I was complaining to Jackson. And Jackson brought up an interesting point. Um, when I get into a project, I get overwhelmed, tons of anxiety, have to walk away, come back, walk away, come back. And when you know yourself and you know that's just the weak side of your brain, trying to escape a hard thing. Once you know that, you can do the opposite. You're like, that's just my brain. That's the weak side of me talking right now. I can just buckle down and do this regardless. So I think it's important that you know yourself so you know your weak points. That way you don't succumb to them. As we do business and move into older years of life, you kind of know those points in your life where you just don't like to do them and you try to put them off and you try to avoid doing them. And for me, it's responding, responding to a message via email or text. I don't like doing it. I like to wait. I like to respond to a bunch at the same time. So a habit that I've been able to develop that keeps the stress off is the minute I receive it, I respond to it. And that gives your brain no time to decide what it wants to do. You're just <laughs> forced to execute. And I think it's important to know yourself enough to be able to point out those things because truth is we are not high functioning individuals. We are not high performers, but we can be with training of our mind. And the fastest way to do that is to try to get to understand yourself. And I recently took the understanding yourself test by Jordan Peterson. And that was a very thorough test and kind of eye opening on myself as weak areas within my mental thought process. And oddly enough, that test did bring up a scenario very similar to delaying response. So it's good to know that about myself. Yeah, I'm the same way. But if I get a text message that's mildly difficult to respond to, I will just set my phone down like, oh, I'll deal with that later. And then I procrastinate, procrastinate. So I get so pissed at myself that I actually do it. But the right thing to do would be to respond immediately before you can allow all those emotions to take over. This actually brings up an interesting topic that I delved into with my mentor back in the day. I used to use negative pressure as motivation. And here's how it looked like as a child. I knew I needed to milk the goat before I went to bed. I did not feel like milking the goat. So I would put off milking the goat until it was so late at night and so overdue that finally I was just like, oh, I have to, and I would get it done. But there was such a buildup of negative pressure. That's why I would go do it. It was fueling me to just get it done. And I would let stuff stack up in my life like that until I felt the negative pressure finally be motivating enough to get me to push towards it. So that's using negativity as fuel. So how do we use positivity as fuel? Because when you use positivity, you feel excited and energized. And notice this about yourself. We brought this up before that when you're doing some things, you're checking the clock. When you're doing other things, time flies. And so I uh, am keenly aware that there's a few things I have to do in my business to keep it rolling that are not my favorite things to do. Long term would be great to outsource, delegate, automate those things that I keep checking the clock on. Sometimes for the short term, though, you got to eat the shit sandwich. You got to just keep going forward until it's to the sustainable point of letting that go to somebody else's hands. So here's how I know with my body, my personality, how I am wired. When I'm pouring energy into something that is sucking me dry, it'll leave me ultimately unhappy. It'll eventually deplete me and my, my, I'll be exhausted. You know, when you're looking at Instagram reels or Facebook reels, how you get like that numbness that kind of starts at your eyes and then goes across the top of your head and you're in the zone now. <laughs> You've been sucked into the vortex. There's that sensation. I get that sensation. When I know I'm working on something that isn't ultimately going to make me the happiest, it's not my favorite thing to be doing. It's not the thing that energizes me. Example, today I'm sitting down having to write a newsletter and writing is not my favorite thing to do. Uh, and I'm just like, 
feeling that pressure, starting my eyes, going to the top of my head, and time is going on and on. I'm not getting anything typed. It's like I'm not getting anything done. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take a break from this and just do something else just to do a reset. So I crawled out of the front of my house, put a huge ladder up there, opened the screens and started washing windows I've never been able to reach before because I didn't know those screens were on hinges and could open. I literally got so much done in like 20 minutes and I felt excited and energized before that. I was like, I need a Red Bull. Maybe I'll take a nap today. I was clear. I was relaxed. Everything just felt right with the world. And all I did is stand on a ladder wiping off a window. But then as soon as I went back in that room to finish writing that thing, boom, that pressure came back. I was thinking about just taking a nap. Maybe do it tomorrow. So using that positive pressure to, um, to motivate us requires us recognizing with what is out of our zone. And it's not going to be our forte. It's not going to be the thing that we can excel at. Somebody else might be able to. We need to find that person and integrate them in if that's necessary. But there's some things that you can just kill at it. You can get so much done and be so efficient and on your game. You're not going to have that numb feeling. You're not going to have that I need to take a nap feeling. You're going to be amazed at how much you got done and how easy it was. That feeling was really the big, was my summer. So I was on paternity leave and I decided to redo my bathroom. And I was so tired all summer. Like I didn't want to get out of bed. Didn't want to, like this, this bathroom was the bane to my existence. I would procrastinate as long as I could during the day, but I know I have to do it and watch videos. And, and I was talking to uh, someone about it. And if, if I feel like in a lot of ways, God was saying, okay, you keep picking things you don't like to do. Let's really let you grind your face through it this time. Just really go for that bathroom, you know, spend a month, like two months in there. You'll, you'll not do it again. And because I thought maybe I should be doing bathrooms, you know, I should be doing all these things, but the reality is I would, probably rather be building these sick four wheel drives. And for all I know, I were to be building them and making tons of money or whatever it may be with them. I don't know. Maybe I'd just be so happy. I didn't care that they didn't make money. I don't know, but maybe that's not my lane. Maybe I'm not the remodel guy. Yeah, I can do it. Sure. And it was done, you know, it, to my standards, maybe not to some people's, but it was turned out nice, but I was drained all summer because of it. I think the same thing can happen when you just been taking L after L. Like you just get so discouraged. And one thing I've learned to do to kind of bring some positivity into your life is just find a small little win, find that next step. Um, you, I've seen friends and people uh, I knew go down that path where they just keep catching L after L and then it just spirals until they're just in the uh, depths of despair. But I think the only way to get out of that is just catch a little win, catch another win until your mindset changes the male brain is compartmentalized and we like to think in compartments we also like to go into areas of emptiness and i feel that when we're working on something that we don't feel is giving us energy or not aligning with our mission or something that we absolutely desire our brain as we're doing that activity starts to drift into you want to go into an empty box but you're doing something so you go into this misery box and your mindset's in this misery mindset. And there's almost uh, an identity or a purpose in this misery. And you're kind of just wallowing in it. It becomes you and you're hanging around in that misery mindset. And to break out of that, it's hard because you have a purpose in this misery and in this mindset. So you can go into this empty box. Maybe you go on Instagram while you're doing the project and your, your mind's kind of numbed. And then you go back into this misery box. And every man is different. Someone might be very happy doing their bathroom, you know, and that's, that's not for you. You don't know that until you do your bathroom. So it's, it's important to go into that misery box, but not stay in it. When it comes to energy, like sadness is just low energy. Happiness is high energy. And it's like a, the concept of a battery. It's not that you need to get a bigger battery. It's that you need to unhook some things that are pulling the current out of the battery, and then you'll instantly have energy. Remember as a kid, when there was the promise of uh, fishing in the morning or going somewhere or a friend coming over, you couldn't even sleep and you were up before the alarm clock. You had all this energy. Where did that come from? Did somebody walk in there and jolt you with it? No, it was your own brain um, feeling the excitement of you moving towards something that aligned with what you wanted and where you wanted to go. and and things that you love, things that fill you up were all on the horizon. So your energy was imme immediately up. You weren't in that misery box. So here we are 
as adults having to do the daily grind to maintain a lifestyle that allows survival the way our society is set up where we have to use money to buy food and things like this. And we're forced to do this stuff that drains us. We think we need a caffeine. We think we need more sleep. We think we have low thyroids. We think we have worms. We've thought it all. We're sure something's wrong with us. But then there's other days like you described on your dirt bike this weekend or me this afternoon scrubbing on a window on the side of a house in the sunshine where I had all the energy in the world and my brain was clear and everything was fine and I felt energized and not tired at all. So there's two points that are happening here. One is the reality of what you're actually doing, but it's our mindset about it, honestly, that we're sitting with because we're still breathing the same oxygen. We still had the same food for breakfast. We still live in the same place. Nothing's changed physically. We didn't catch a virus, but our thought about it is what drained us down. Even when I was a kid, it was the thought of milking the goat that was so exhausting. The actual execution wasn't that draining, but the thought of it, man. Oh, and so here we are living as slaves to our thoughts. Now, can we stop thoughts? I mean, this is something the theologians have been battling forever. You got the monk on the mountain that's managed to clear his mind of everything and become one with all. But in reality, when you're dealing with other humans and problems and business and stuff, that's not going to be an option. Your brain is full of stuff. What has worked for you guys in being able to not let the mindset take you down when the problem is pretty much just the mindset? You know, this has proven itself enough times in my life that I think I could, I would classify it as, as a law of, of success and that's momentum. It, it can be so tough getting going. And, uh, like I said earlier, when you're catching all these L's and everything sucks, you kind of get in this pit of despair, but then you get a couple wins and then you get a couple more this last month. I had the best sales I've ever had. And it's potentially with the worst market I've ever had. The last two months I had the worst two, or the two previous months were the two worst months I've ever had in sales. And I was down about it. It's like this market sucks. Nobody's going to buy. And I, my, that was my mindset. And then I came in this month, changed my mindset a little bit, sold a little bit, sold a little bit. And then I blew the top off and went far beyond what I, my goal ever was. Um, close to a, a store record. And all that was, was momentum is I just kept moving. I caught, I caught a win. Okay, I can get another one. I did, I, I'll do more. And you kind of get into this elevated mindset and you don't get discouraged and you're only seeing the positive things. It's a positive energy pushing you forward. There's a lot of power and momentum. I've really trained myself and kind of become aware of this in the last year. Um, we're, we're all one thought away from being happy. And I know Garrett and I have talked about this where it's hard to control your thoughts, but you can put thoughts into your mind and you can put good thoughts in your mind. And a while back, I was having a bad day at work. I was pretty down about, you know, interest rates being up and all this stuff. And I looked over and saw a coworker trying to chuck a drill, like the old school drill, into a drill gun. And he only has one hand. And he was like holding the drill up by his neck. And I thought, wow, I'm really thankful I had two hands. And I was instantly happier. That it, And so I started to do this technique where every time I have a negative thought, I think of a couple things that I'm thankful for or things that I do have. And it's, it's wild because you instantly change your perspective in that moment. That's hard, hard things to follow up on. But the one that I normally do is dirt biking. If I can, let's just be honest. I only went dirt biking once this year, once this year. And I came back this last week. My wife said, you need to go. I think you need to go once a month and rent a hotel room, go dirt, but you need to get out of that once a month by yourself. I don't even really prioritize it for myself, but I need to. And what was being mentioned earlier, each one of you had different points. So the misery box, uh, loser, the waking up tired, the brain fog, all of these things I have also observed is if you can't tell what you like or don't like, uh, sometimes it's hard to know when you grew up in a family where you literally just did suck it up and do it. You were just the man. There wasn't an off. You just did it that way. Didn't think, didn't have a choice, but the goat is to look at your physical symptoms. Your body may be telling you that you don't like doing something. You may be super tired, don't like getting out of bed, but then one day you're going to go do something and you had no issues getting out of bed. Oh, well, what's the difference? I was going to go dirt back and say, now I get up early and I'm fine. Every day of the week, I got up the, later and I was tired. That's the difference. So your body's telling you something. Do you work in the misery box, watch TikTok, 
then go drive and you're like, is it even safe for me to drive? Well, maybe it's, it actually is not safe for you to drive because you're living in a life that's not in alignment with what you should be doing. Your head's not clear. I'm glad you brought up body awareness because I actually, I'm going to go back once again to my washing the window story today. That was intentional. I am very well aware of the cues in my own body when I've reached the point where productivity is now on the decline. A classic example I think anybody can relate to, you're staying up late trying to get a project done. Maybe you're trying to write something or paint something or finish something, and it's getting later and later. And eventually, as you're losing your clarity and energy, you're, you're just keenly aware that what I got done in the last hour, I could have done about in 20 minutes a few hours ago. Like The productivity is dropping quickly. And you just know, listen, if I don't go to bed right now, I'm not going to get anything done worth talking about, even if I stay up the rest of the night. I'm done. And we go to bed and we start a new day. So when we're in the middle of something, we can feel that energy point going down and the cues in our body are starting to fire off. Maybe it's that numbness I talked about where you're starting to zone out or your energy is so low. You're like, I can't keep my eyelids open. I need to take a nap. It's time to bring something in intentionally that puts your energy back up and then just let, let that be for a minute. And then when you come back, you'll be able to get so much more done so much quicker. It'll blow your mind instead of sitting there plowing through it. I've talked to Austin, who's not on this call tonight, about writer's block before. And he talked about like when you hit writer's block, you could sit there for eight hours and not get anything done. But if you just got off your butt, walked around the block and came back and sat down, boom, something will pop in your mind and you'll get it written out quickly. So continuing to press forward when everything is just falling faster than you can pick it up is not the way of success. <laughs> we are working very hard towards something, but it's important to realize that Postponed gratification is not the hustle. We're not hustling to postpone gratification. It's important to take take a moment and realize what where you're at. I don't think the human body, the caveman human, do you think the caveman human was like, well, if I just do enough, then I won't have to do anything? Or were they living every day as it was in the now? I know we're in this hustle life and we are postponing quite a bit of gratification and that's kind of bleak. <laughs> that's actually a funny <laughs> thought. Yeah. Was the caveman stacking coconuts up? Like, man, if I stack a huge stack, when I turn 40, I could just sit in the ocean all day and just <laughs> eat my coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> you don't give it. No, he didn't. He, he was fine getting a coconut and sitting in the ocean and then getting another. He was fine doing it each day by day or season by season. And nowadays with social media, I feel like everyone's kind of in the rat race because prior to social media, you know, you only saw a Lamborghini a couple times in your life. You're like, oh, wow, we're going to the Lamborghini, you know, that's kind of crazy. And so the day to day, like just living was where it was at, you know, have it, hanging out with your friends, living in the moment. But now we're all, I feel like we're all in this pursuit of something. Is it even going to be worth it? Be aware of what's your lane use different signals which we've discussed your body you know your sleep your energy levels to determine what is your lane and sometimes you suck it up and manage it but you should choose a way to switch to what you're good at because you don't want to be somebody that's doing something and deferring your gratification forever and never enjoying life you stack up a huge coconut stack because you're this caveman that's going to quit you know hunting for fruit every day and he doesn't he never knows when to stop stacking coconuts well that's not a productive life so with that any further additions before we wrap it up no i don't know all right see you guys